If you go off hiking or driving in the vicinity of Eastern Oregon or Eastern Washington, you're bound to notice a lot of this dark colored rock all over. Sometimes it's rubbly, sometimes it forms really neat looking picturesque columns, and you might be wondering, what is this? Well, the rock you're seeing is called basalt. Basalt is a volcanic rock that comes from the cooling of magma. And in this case, you're actually looking at what's called a flood basalt. It's called a flood basalt because literally basaltic magma flooded the landscape and spread across the Columbia Plateau, even reaching the Pacific Ocean. Now this is not the only flood basalt on Earth. There are actually many flood basalts throughout Earth's history that have been recognized, such as the Siberian and Deccan Traps, the Atlantic Magmatic Province. These events were huge. These flood basalts have been correlated with mass extinctions in Earth's history. Now, the geologic history of the west coast of North America is rather complex. Most flood basalts are somehow related to mantle plume processes. And on the west coast, we do have a mantle plume process. We have a hot spot associated with the Snake River Plain and currently the Yellowstone hotspot feature. But we also have subduction zone activity going on still off the west coast. That's what gives us all that line of volcanoes such as Mount St. Helens and Mount Rainier. Geologists who have studied the Columbia River Basalt Group have identified seven distinct formations and each of those formations contain many different individual flows leading to hundreds of different flows within the Columbia River Basalt Group. Here are the seven different formations that are recognized. Now, what's interesting to notice is from these formations, we can see which flows happened earlier and which ones were later in the many millions of years that covered the Columbia River Basalt lava flows. We can also recognize something else that's interesting, and that's the volume of flow within each of these formations. Now, if we look at something like the Grand Ronde Basalt, that encompasses over 70% of all of the material of the Columbia River Basalt Group. And if we look at the Grand Ronde and the Steens combined, that's almost 90% of all the material that's recognized in the Columbia River Basalt. So the bulk of it occurred in these formations, and the bulk of that actually occurred in a relatively short geologic span of around a million years. Hey, just a real quick message from me, Heather, the host here at Let's Go Geo. Actually, I am host, videographer, photographer, editor, creator, all that stuff. This channel is run solely by me, and I started it because I do love geology and all things related to the topic, and I love teaching, and I thought it would be a great way to bring to people that in the field experience, but digitally. So... Let's Go Geo was born. The project's going well, but I have a lot of great other ideas. So if you want to help me out, support me, and help the project move along, you can find me on Patreon, and you can become a fan there as well as get access to exclusive content. So head over to Patreon. Otherwise, let's get back to today's topic. A given flow typically consists of three main components, the top, the middle, and the bottom. Now the middle is the dense interior, or the colonnade zone, that typically contains these basalt columns that form when the material is cooling. When magma cools, it fractures into these hexagonal or polygonal shapes. If we look at this, we can see the joints behind me forming. Now this forms again from the cooling of magma and is somewhat similar to the way that mud cracks form into hexagonal shapes, but those form from the process of drying, whereas this is from the process of cooling. As you can see behind me, we see a lot of those basalt columns. So we know we must be in the dense interior of a flow. This particular formation behind me is the Grand Ronde, and that's one of the most voluminous formations in all of the Columbia River basalt. Rivers cut deep into rocks, forming canyons and giving us awesome views of basalt columns, like you see here. You can see great examples in places like the Columbia River Gorge, but also in Mallard Canyon in Oregon and, and canyons in the Blue Mountains, and also places in Eastern Washington, such as around Yakima. The basalt can cool and form into some really neat shapes from the typical vertical columns to fans and rosette patterns. Now the Columbia River Basalt Group consists of an enormous amount of material that was extruded onto the land many millions of years ago. 
It consisted of about 210,000 kilometers cubed of lava that flooded the Pacific Northwest. And this all occurred around 17 million to around 5 million years ago. But the bulk of the material was extruded around 16 million years ago. And at the time, something interesting was also happening with the climate in the mid-Miocene. Now, even though this basalt accounts for a much smaller total than some of those larger historic events, it's still a lot of material. And it turns out that individual flows may actually be comparable to individual flows within those larger events. Researchers in a 2018 study wanted to take a closer look at the Columbia River Basalt Group and see if it actually could also be responsible for short-term climate impacts. Now, during the mid-Miocene, there actually was a notable event. It's referred to as the Mid-Miocene Climate Optimum, or the MMCO, and it represents a warming period in Earth's history around 16 million years ago. So the question is, could that be correlated with the Columbia River basalt flows? The researchers wanted to answer that exact question, but they needed to take a much closer look and refine some of the units and dates in the Columbia River basalt group. They did this by using uranium-lead geochronology. They dated zircons found in volcanic ash beds interspersed throughout the Columbia River basalt group. During the main phase of eruptions, during the Columbia River basalt flows, this would be the Grand Ronde and adjacent flows where most of the material was extruded, effusion rates were found to be around 0.3 kilometers cubed per year. But individual members can be much higher. The Wapshilla Ridge member was found to have effusion rates over one kilometer cubed per year and possibly even higher. Researchers took a look at the many, probably over 20 individual flows within this member alone, and estimated that the flow effusion rates may have been over 20 kilometers cubed per year at peaks. Now this is important because this could be orders of magnitude higher than some of those larger igneous provinces. Now what they discovered is that the bulk of the material that was erupted happened in a narrow window between 16.7 and 15.9 million years ago, making it eerily close to that 16 million year old mid-Miocene warming event. This mid-Miocene warming event was marked by temperatures that were five degrees Celsius above the background. This probably triggered vertebrate migrations and new species originations. Now we can also take a closer look at the oceanic and atmospheric conditions during this time by looking at benthic sediments and microscopic species that lived in the ocean at the time. We'll talk more about this here when I go into micropaleontology. But just know that isotopes are involved in the process. We can look at oxygen and carbon isotopes to look at ratios and decide what kind of fluctuations were happening in the ocean and in the atmosphere, which the two are connected. Now, by looking at this information, the researchers were able to determine that there was an increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide at the time, probably two times the normal expected rate. And so it seems quite plausible that those Columbia River flood basalts are somehow linked, if not the cause, of that mid-Miocene warming and environmental perturbations. Now it's important to note here that during this time, atmospheric carbon dioxide so was over. 400 parts per million. And we actually just passed that threshold in modern times. We're now well above 400 parts per million and growing. So this may be an indicator of what's to come in our very uncertain climate future. Thank you.